fans of the shit talk will know that <clears throat> a missed episode is something that is not to be recreated, but we've you recorded episodes where... You can't do it again, yeah. Where Dara has been chief <laughs> audio recorder and it's not been recording. <clears throat> so do you want to start off this shit talk? Oh, sorry. I'll put this up on Spotify, right, because people keep asking. But right. you have to promise to leave this on a tab in the background playing till the finish. You have yes. to like it, leave a comment, and then yeah. leave it running. It's really important. And lads, if we see if we see that's happening, we'll just stop putting them up. We won't put them on Spotify anymore. If I see more views on Spotify and SoundCloud. Lads, we know you're doing it. I can tell. I have the metrics. Yeah. I have all the metrics. <laughs> it's on the computer. Like, so if I see twi- <laughs> It's on the pewters. <laughs> if I see more on Spotify. We see people logging off after the first 10 minutes. No more Spotify. No more Spotify. No more Spotify. We can't be putting up our long videos on YouTube. And then YouTube saying that people watch the first 30 seconds because yeah. they clicked on the Spotify. Yeah, they already call us losers in there. So you just leave this playing in the background. Yeah. Right, do you want to start this off on a sad note or a fun note? Obviously a fun note. Okay, we're going with the sad note anyway, right? So <clears throat> obviously, you know... It's, it's, you know what, you know, what's actually really sad is the fact that you yet again prepared notes for the it Shit Talk podcast. It makes the Shit Talks better podcast when we have... No, prepared. it makes it better for you because you can be more more pointed in your attacks. Sorry, did you prepare stuff for the Shit Talk? Yeah. Okay, what have you prepared? Go on, you do your bit first. Right, I, so uh, on a bit of a... Um, recently in the last few years, just a lot more Irish history, you know. Mm. Uh, often very sad I would say always sad Always sad, yeah I'm actually struggling I don't think, think we've had a happy day in our history <clears throat> I don't think we have either And today is not that day What okay. I'm bringing up So I've been reading about one of the 1916 revolutionaries mm-hmm. One of the gentlemen who were executed And this is very sad now I mean, this is like Is this really what we want? We're here for shit talks This is something I wanted to talk about So it's um, We're By talking about God, it. go on So Michael or Michal Kant. Kant is spelled C A N N T for any uh, non Irish people. Not a very common name anymore, really, but uh, he was a one of the revolutionaries. His brother was there. Uh, quite an interesting character, but this is from his diary the day or the day before he was <sighs> executed. So. This reminds me of when you used to send me those videos on Sunday mornings so when you knew I was hungover. <laughs> Go on. I never saw him look so well. He was wearing the grand green uniform of the Irish Volunteers. His moustache was trimmed and his face looked tanned and healthy. He was the grand noble face, nothing in his life to be ashamed of. His gentle, kindly eyes looked out calmly on God's world, fearing none save God. After we left the cell and before the sentry shut the door, I looked back at poor Ned and that picture I shall all bear with me to the end. He stood sideways, right side towards me, the candles showing up clearly from the exterior darkness, looking down at the little table where he'd been writing, wrapped in thought, silent, a pucker at the base of his forehead, just at the nose. My heart welled up with infinity, infinite pity for the poor, poor lad that I brought to school. But controlling myself, I said out loudly, almost fiercely, Bianacht de Lat, so God's blessings on you. And back answered at once in his old calm, quite way, he was if you were saying good night. Uh, Goshori Diagwit. So may God favor you, Shorif. Shorif. So that's him saying goodbye. It's a lovely start, girl. Before he. That was his brother wrote that? No, he wrote that about the last time he saw his brother. Okay, okay, okay. So they were What's both. the name of the book? Uh, there's That's not from a book, that's just from something I was reading online. Some, uh, oh, okay, okay. Not okay. opinion pieces, from essays, you know? Yes. So there's a lot of those books, there's a lot of revolutionary books. There's a. F- Fuck ton on Michael Collins. Yes. I've read two of them on Michael Collins. They haven't. Yeah. They haven't been great. Yeah. To be honest, the best the best <clears> book I've <throat> written, I've written, I've read on the the whole War for Independence and the Rising is The Guns of Easter. Mm-hmm. The, other, the school one, the childhood yeah, one. Yeah, That's yeah, one yeah. the best ones. One of the best yeah. written ones anyway. It's uh those books are difficult because you already have so much of an opinion coming into it. Mm-hmm. Like you're not gonna pick up a book on Tom Barry without n- previously knowing a good wedge of that story you know and mm-hmm. having an opinion on it going into it and i think as irish people that opinion is so heavily burnt into you mm-hmm. that then you start seeing some different light to things or maybe a rhetoric that's slightly different and then the whole book is problematic then because of that you know the there's a huge amount of specific history there that's not something you'd never find out about unless you went looking, yes. you know. And obviously we're taught a lot of it in schools very heavily from primary school to a certain extent then to secondary school, you know, a lot of that history. 
and I think you're taught enough in some ways, but like if you really wanted to find out about it, you'd have to be going very specific for yourself, or <clears> I'm <throat> sure some people. I think history is kind of like that as a topic, though, isn't it? Yeah. Like you really do have to specialize in something to really find out a lot about it. You know, Dan Carlin, the yeah. historian, he doesn't call himself a historian. Yes. He's just, he calls himself an amateur. He's just kind of an enthusiast. And he'll always say it. He's like, in his like crusty voice, yeah. he's like, I'm not a historian. <laughs> I'm a, uh, just an enthusiast. He, the level of research that goes into those podcasts, those podcasts are like five hours long. But he takes like a year to make them. Mm. He puts more work into those than some PhDs. Certainly more than some masters put into their thesis. hundred percent. You know what? Pe- <laughs> Somebody whose master's thesis has done in thirty six hours. <laughs> do you know what? I, you know what I do? A little pet peeve of mine has always mm. been since I've been in university. Yes. Was when undergrads call it a dissertation. Call their dissertation or thesis their final project. You're doing a school project. Like it's called an. It's an FYP. I, like projects, whatever your final thing. Yeah. They're not theses. They're not. No, no, no. It's no. master students do yeah. dissertations. Yeah. And then PhDs defend their doctorate or whatever. Yeah, it's a really weird thing. It's stupid. That's kind of what I did my undergrad thesis on. That's not a thing. Like that's not a thing. It's an FYP. You're doing a school project. Like you're doing your homework. Your like. art project. Yeah. Like. Give me a break. Will you? Like I did one in. Um, mine was called the production and purification of. Uh, Cytochrome C550. Titillating read, lad. You should look it up. <laughs> sounds like, you know, you'd be like, oh, that sounds like a thesis. It's not. No. It's The work I did there was the basic work for someone to go do their PhD on. Like, mm-hmm. like it was like the step they do. It was like a runner putting on his shoe to go run a mile. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it sounds okay, but it's not. It's not a thesis. It's just a project. No. Like. No, I think the way, like a good way of, it was explained to me is, so for your PhD, you usually do, you, you do like four or five or six papers mm-hmm. and maybe one of those papers if you had a very very good master's dissertation mm. maybe that would be one of those papers yeah like the body work for phd is massive but i don't think anything at fyp level translates over to like it's like a thumbnail for a dissertation or a thesis i think i have a question for our americans listening mm-hmm. so in ireland Ireland specifically, I don't know about other... Actually, you know what? I have a question for everyone listening. So We're obsessed with potatoes. In Ireland, right? When you're drunk... No, when someone has a PhD in Ireland, very rarely, if ever, will they refer to themselves as doctor in no. a non-academic setting, in ceremonial roles, or sometimes people put stuff in their email. Most of the time, if you do that, even when you do it there, most people think you're a knob. People will think you're a langer. Yeah, the only time it's commonly used... Like, maybe the footer of an email, it would be Derfordshire PhD. Or if I'm at a conference. Yeah, yeah, you'd be introduced by somebody else. As doctor. Yeah. And you would never refer to yourself as doctor. Never. Very no. distinctly. No, quite a few PhDs. A lot of pe- people in Ireland get PhDs, very well educated mm-hmm. in that regard. And only the only people with who refer to themselves as doctors or have it in their email regularly are people with the, what I would say insecurity around that kind of stuff or are clawing at something you know they'll have the full remesh the signature yes it's uh it's a thing so it'd be interesting to know if in other countries because you know we have we see it online now with a lot of um youtubers and especially in the hypertrophy space and i won't name anyone particular people yes but they all respond everyone knows who you're talking about they're doctors there's yeah. a few of them now and they're responsible of doctors you know obviously like we sign off all our emails with like msc bsc yeah like obviously that's I'm the, but a lowly undergrad. Yeah, but you still have VSE after it. Like. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. The <laughs> first day <aid> trained. <laughs> you were close to doing a PhD. I was. I Sika kind of took that away from you, didn't Sika, it? <laughs> Sika did take it away from me, yeah. Because I was, I was obviously going to get a proper job. But then I was doing Sika as well on the side. And then I feel like PhDs, when you have a proper job, are like this aspirational thing of... I'm going to go here and it'll be great and I'll get to like really look into what I want to look into and it'll be like almost aspirational that you have a PhD or an offer of a PhD. Mm-hmm. But then with Seek It, I'm like, oh, I can go here and really look into what I want to look into and mm. have that like freedom to upskill or whatever. And we did talk about, because the PhD you were offered was, would have been relevant to what we do, mm. I suppose, in some regards, but also making money is more important for yes. us. Yes. In that regard, the PhD money is not real money as well. No, like the money we would need to make to live was more important than yeah. the benefit that would have gotten because the benefit from that wouldn't have been that much, you know. Yeah, I remember when I was doing that fourth year project, the our supervisor 
was like there was like three of us in the group and the the subject of PhD came up you know another lecturer came along and was like a couple of future PhD candidates and he looked around at us and we were all like <laughs> no <laughs> just averting eye contact <laughs> yeah, just, it's a spider man yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. he was like no way PhD in biochemistry would oh I'm, my god I'm sure I would have ended it all there would also be no reason to do one well, for no, me no. like the only reason I would have had an interest in doing one is to go into teaching and into academia mostly in Ireland that's the way that's the way yeah like if you're in sport and exercise science, the only reason you do a PhD is to go into lecturing. Yeah. Pretty much across the board. Yeah. I, I can't think of anybody who is like, even the like pracademics, which is a nice little term for you there. I'll mm-hmm. give you that one for free. Go on. Even the pracademics only do PhDs because you need a PhD to be a lecturer. And I know some people are like, oh, you don't need, you can be, you can have a master's and be a lecturer. Not in Ireland. Virtually never happens. At university level, I would say, never happens. Some of the post-leaving certs and stuff would have masters. master's level teachers there, but most, most are PhDs. The The thing in Ireland is that PhDs are very well, sorry, not very well taken care of. The funding compared to like European average and the American average is much lower. Apparently in the States, they get great money when they're doing their PhDs. It's very, very hard to get a PhD in the United okay. States, from what I gathered, it's really competitive. Oh, okay, okay. Now, it is very hard to get a PhD in Ireland, but not from what I gather as hard as the US, from what, yes. I've seen, from what I've seen. I've had some of my athletes get rejected for doing PhDs in legitimate things, like not in like sciences, hard sciences, you know, real really? sciences. Really? Yeah. What, like, you rejected, me. like, you won't coach them because they're doing a PhD? <laughs> well, I rejected them when they got rejected for PhD, because I was like, what kind of loser is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, they rang me for a reference, they're like, should we give them PhD? And I was like, no way. No way. No, but I've it's seen, it's happened more than once over the last few years. It's crazy. It's random, yeah. I've I've known a few people in Ireland who have got rejected as well. We know some people. Yes. They did eventually get their PhD, but it took a couple of years. A couple of wasted years, not going to lie. Yeah, that is. Terrible waste of time. Yeah. Doing a PhD. The weird thing with a PhD is you're pretty much, if you're doing a PhD and you have either the funding or your personal funding to hang in there, you're just guaranteed to get it. Mm. It's just a matter of time. Um, But the difficult thing is like those few years, you make no money. Yeah. You're holding on for ethics approval. You're holding on for grant approval. Your supervisor might be holding on for a bigger grant to come in that will look after six or seven different projects. Mm. I hate the idea of relying on somebody else for things. Oh, 100%. Particularly when that other person would be an academic. The thing is in Ireland is that maybe of our oldest siblings generation, so 15 years of separation, Mm -hmm. having a PhD was a guaranteed financial incentive in industry. Absolutely, yeah. You were really guaranteed a lot of extra money and to progress from there. From what I've seen in industry, while I was in pharmaceutical industry, it was kind of swinging around about. So initially it was experience is really important. Then it was like experience didn't matter in education. You just came on green and they train you. Uh, for some places in the kind of local group we were in, the problem was that was a lot of people were coming out of university really well educated coming in green without experience and being absolutely useless. <laughs> and it it was a, a very evident problem for them. So they were like, yeah. Jesus, these people with masters were... Like, cause everyone was coming in on a master's in analytical chemistry or analytical sciences. Yes. And being terrible at working as an analyst, you know, really inept. Now, I don't know if that was a generational thing or an education thing. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. then it swung back to um, they were being really picky with people with experience and being a little bit more in tune with education and stuff. Yeah, you think for for lab work like that, experience trumps everything, and not not experience in a, a, an academic lab, but experience in like a large scale multinational lab where your SOPs and everything are mm. like you just take that ring binder off the shelf, you open it up, find your tab, and that is exactly what you do. Do you think that level of experience would be so much more important than any amount of? So the thing I always maintain was that if if you weren't a dumbass, you could do an analyst job once you got trained. Yes. You might be able to problem solve or improve in methods or develop new methods. You actually wouldn't. I could yeah. not even probably you definitely couldn't. But if you were not if you you didn't need a degree to do that job mm-hmm. if you were a competent individual. Like any organized consistent individual yeah. could do that job and do the the mundane work of the 
the regular stuff, you know, and mm-hmm. for most places, you know. But if you want to improve oneself, obviously you need education and a back in in sciences. And then yeah, yeah, that stuff is amazing. Like people who develop methods and stuff. My God, yeah, in, uh, incredible, truly incredible. Yeah. Now we'll move away from. <laughs> that nonsense so i have a couple of things one of the things i wanted to it's ref- a pretty comprehensive script today isn't it it's actually not as comprehensive as last week but we missed a couple of things in the week before okay so i want to turn to the harry potter plot holes okay so, oh we're going for this again so i feel like you're always in the defensive you're super defensive harry potter but yeah but this one is one i should have brought up brought up i should have brought up originally right right so we're talking about plot holes in harry potter in the previous shit talk and of which there's uh, several but the most obvious one is the use of time travel yes. in the third book, third yeah. movie. That was a, such a... That's t- not the third one, is it? It was Prisoner of Azkaban. Is As- that the third one? Prisoner of Azkaban. Jesus. Azkaban. Uh, I, I fully accept, yeah, our little partial deviation where time travel becomes a thing for a year and then never again. That is an issue, yeah. I would have even given it to them if they somehow explained it away, if this was like the only Yeah, where they thing. had to destroy it afterwards. But... The fact that they once had time travel, and it's not like this time travel was one where Hermione could just go back in time and view stuff but not interact. They f- they used it in the whole story to interact and everything. Why didn't they go back and kill Voldemort <laughs> as a baby? You know, why didn't they go back and... Mm-hmm. And even if there was like an extent to how far you could go back, they could have still easily used it in any yeah. number of situations. Time travel is something that should never be used in any story unless the entire premise of that movie or story is time travel. For everyone else, it's such a huge issue. It produces so many problems. Yeah, it even for continuity of the story, it produces so many problems. Like in that Harry Potter one where they're down at like, they're down at Hagrid's cabin and they're about to kill the hippogriff. It is the hippogriff they're about to kill, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and they have to do something where like they throw a stone in the window. Mm-hmm. Like all that is so confusing and takes away from the the essential essence of that story. It gets so dark as well as they. she realised more adults were reading the books, I feel like, as the yeah. movies go on, you know. That kind of adds to it, I feel. I preferred the whimsical school Did you? adventure kind of thing. I really like the darkness. Oh. I, um, <laughs> the bad, <laughs> like, you believe in a thing called love? I is, is that who sang that song? The darkness, yeah. I really, yeah, I enjoyed that. I like the kind of evolution of those characters and the evolution of that world. Mm-hmm. I feel like the whimsical thing, if she had written seven books and they were all like that, it would have never been the success it was. It would have just been this kind of like, meh. You know, it would just have been kids' books forever. Another thing, I don't know if we talked about this last week, but the Ron and Hermione romance doesn't make any sense. Why? Hermione's just just way out of Ron's leagues. like So? It's love. You literally just said, you literally just brought up song that's, do you believe in a thing called love? Like, everyone knows Harry and Hermione were heading for... Maybe. Love. Maybe. And then she... Then he went off with Ron's younger sister. And you're defending that? No. He's best Jesus friend's Christ younger sister. No, no that's... That's probably the biggest plot hole in the entire thing. You know, as well, Hermione basically got them out of a lot of different things. Yeah, because she's the smarty pants. Yeah, like Harry gets all the credit for... Nah, Harry's just the big swinging dick in the equation, like, to he be fair. didn't die once, and then suddenly it's like he's the man. But Hermione's the one who actually thought about things and made some plans. Yeah. Hermione is the person... Hermione. Who's the person when you're going camping, and she's brought all this off. She's, yeah. You're going out to the wilderness, and Harry's just some dumbass, basically. Dumbass a bit of a stretch. What has he done that's productive? Uh, he was the ultimate in like he was the person who found all the Horcruxes and destroyed them. And that's then, funny because Dumbledore showed him, and Hermione was with him for the rest of the ones. Yeah, Hermione helped, like no, Hermione was the driver. But also, force. Hermione is no good in a little battle, like like neither Harry. Is, neither is Harry. What are you talking about? Neither is Harry. Yeah, when was Harry he literally for? battled the Lord of Darkness or whatever his name was? Only because of some plot armor is what was keeping him alive. Plot armor. Yeah. Harry Potter is the definition you're, of plot armor. No, no. Yeah, 100%. All you're looking for now is a reason for you to not support Harry Potter. Am I you know what I'm, you, is I know for a fact you like these movies. Is this irritating you? I know for a fact you enjoy the Harry Potter I movies. I do, that's what I'm saying. Hermione and was better. the only like. reason you're picking these out is because you know I enjoy them. No, but like... Harry, I could go Harry survived because talk. of plot armor. Hermione survived because of absolute smart and wit. <laughs> Hermione's the goat. Like she practiced, she did her rounds. She did a thousand arm bars, you know. Yeah. She did ten thousand snatches. Yeah. 
She did her volume training. In their practicing throws before training. Harry just wanders in with 10,000 milligrams Harry, of snazzle. Yeah, Harry is the fucking Illy Allen of the Harry Potter world. Don't you dare compare he is. He's not. Yes, he is. Illy he trained is. hard. You're Harry, crying, look. Harry has plot armor. No, Harry, Illy Allen is Harry just... Harry in London. <laughs> oh. oh that was outrageous yeah so the thing with the harry potter plot holes right i understand you're just trying to get at me this yeah, is a I bit am. of a I personal am. slight I, right? no, that's fair that's fair i am for some weird reason you enjoy kids movies called lord of the rings and if i was to go and oh find you, you'd struggle I'd struggle. Owen. 15 years to write one of those books. Yeah. She yeah. wrote them in... 15 she, years because he kept forgetting what people were supposed to be doing. Those... No, that's, I've you're thinking of George R. R. Martin. Who... Game Tolkien. Of Game of Thrones. Anyway. I'm going to come back with plot holes for Lord of the Rings next week. You can't. I, do you know the only thing that's stopping me? Go on. Is actually looking into it. Because watching orcs fight against fucking elves... Yeah, it's just something I am not going to spend my time doing. Oh, but you'll watch Harry Potter. Yeah, she stole everything from Tolkien. Who did? Who were we talking about? J- What's happening? Or J.R. Rowling or whatever the fuck. J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. She Rowling. stole everything from Tolkien. Is it Rowling or Rowling? Well, Rowling, I would say. Or Rowling. W. Rowling. In Ireland, there's a sport called road bowling, but yeah. it's spelled like bowling. Yeah. But some people call it road bowling. I assume it's Rowling. J.K. Rowling. Rowling. Yeah. Uh, anyway, no, don't don't you compare those. Two. Anyway, I, the, literally the only thing that's stopping me is having enough interest in going look at it because those movies do nothing for me. You couldn't, you couldn't find anything. I've watched half of one, and I'd say a third of another one. Watching you, go, did you watch anyone but you? Yes. Was it good? Yes. I would like. To, I want to see it. As rom coms go, it's very watchable. You're like in the cinema on a bi weekly basis at some point. I have a monthly pass for the cinema. I'm very like I'm now I'm very jealous. I yeah I go to the cinema weekly. I don't think I was in the cinema in all of 2023. You were not. I don't think so. It's life of kids. Jesus, that's mad. Yeah. Usually on Tuesdays or Wednesdays I go to the cinema. You'll go. Yeah. You see everything out basically. Everything. Yeah. Anytime I bring up a 14 movie. Fourteen euro. Fourteen. Fourteen. Fourteen euro. Fourteen euro per month. Yeah, that's very good value, lads. That's the price of one cinema ticket. Yeah. Yeah, they've got you. It's working. You're using it. Do you get any treats with that? Uh, I don't. Oh, you're off midweek treats? I don't do treats midweek. Midweeks. Africa does get popcorn and, and coke. The female species are obsessed with popcorn. I'd say she probably eats a cubic meter of popcorn a month. If there's any female... Like an IBC full of popcorn. If there's any of the opposite sex listening, I really would be interested to know what is the story with popcorn. If it's not covered in butter what's or honey, story what's it? the story? I don't get it. True. I hate it because it gets stuck in my teeth. It just doesn't do anything for me. Mm. Like one or two bits of it's really salty, you know, but that's about it. I don't. Yeah, it really doesn't do it for me. What I really enjoy is a bag of trail mix or some cashews. Yes. That's what I get into. Oh, yeah. That's just much loud that's, crunching. That's much. <sighs> yeah. I like the trail mix when there's chocolate and I'll eat the chocolate and then leave everything else. The problem with trail mix that has like those M&Ms in it is I can't eat anything else except the M&Ms until they're gone. <laughs> I have jacked guy in this, but I don't know who <clears throat> I was talking about. The old guy, maybe? Who? The old jacked dude from like 1916 or whatever. Oh, it was that one. Yeah, You're dead right. Okay, Our actually, brains are the same brain. That, well, we do uh, We do run the same company. The jacked guy. So yeah. there was this Eugene Burge thing. Went not viral on TikTok, but it was on the main page for quite a bit. Like it ended up with maybe 150,000 views What's on TikTok. What's the main page of one? Uh, of TikTok. 131,000 views. And I was like, no, every, like watching this, a load of people agreed with me in terms of like, people I asked, checking with people, this individual... Everyone would accuse him, or not everyone, a lot of, sorry, everyone's a wrong statement. A lot of people would accuse him 100%. on Instagram, like he's on gear. 100%, yeah. Like you can go to look at anyone's profile, and regularly, and they'd be like, steroids, emojis, whatever 100%, it is. 100%, yeah. And it went on TikTok, and loads of people are like, I wouldn't think that. I think he's natty. Just contrarian. This is, yeah, it's contrarian, but it, it's also this crazy, dumb, shifted baseline of what an actual human physique looks like. Yeah. Like, that level of physique is insane. You're, that's a one in 500,000. We've seen 
literally thousands of athletes. Yeah. We've been involved in sports for a very, very long time coaching. Now, any of the coaches I've asked, people who've coached people, hypertrophy or whatever, would agree. They have been like, oh, that's incredible. Like PTs and stuff. Yeah. They were like, you never get people like this. And a lot of the TikTok comments were like, oh, that's, I would never think he's natty. That's a terrible physique and stuff. You know, clearly, like, he looks amazing. Yeah. He looks amazing. I can probably think of four people I've come across I can, in 15 years like, of good sport. Movie stars have looked worse than that. And everyone's been like, uh, uh, syringe emojis. 100%. Like, everyone knows. It's but just a contrarian thing on TikTok. But it's contrarian. People just yeah. want to be different. But also, yeah. it's this thing of people just, because you're just looking at, hot dudes with six packs all yeah. day long yeah they're like oh this is perfectly normal but it's that's what i said on the instagram post then as well is that it's so it's we've been messed up so much so zach is talking yeah. about this a little bit he had this meme you know where he was like getting slowly leaner and there was are different people getting leaner and it was mm. like obese in the the fitness industry was like a four pack you know yeah yeah and yeah. unless your dick skin shredded like the joey statics fella or you know someone else who, who is incredibly lean um you're fat, you know? Yeah. And this guy is, is shredded, you know? And, and it's very impressive on the muscle mass. And the, it's just so funny that people have been fucked up so much. Men have been mm-hmm. fucked up so much. So females have a bad have it bad forever, basically. They've yeah. always had a hard time. Men didn't have a hard time because if you looked at, like, most media, 80s and 90s, you kind of had the jacked movie star, a bit of swat yeah. singer, a bit of Sylvester Stallone. Uh, but that was kind of it. No one else, like Mel Gibson wasn't yeah. jacked. He was just moderately in shape. He exercised. He was a fit guy, you might yeah. say. But Lee, uh, Mel Gibson, who was in Lethal Weapon? That was Mel Gibson. Who was in Who was in Die Hard? Oh. What? He's really sick at the moment. He's Yeah, he's a, uh, yeah, he has got very bad dementia. But who was in Lethal Weapon? Was that Mel Gibson? I, I don't. There's people screaming at us now. Yeah. And like, anyway, weapon. these guys just weren't fat. No, they were just not fat. No appreciable muscle tone. Mm-hmm. Just in good shape, like most, like yeah. a, a normal male would be. And then, nothing really for the 2000s. And then slowly, you'd people like The Rock getting much bigger. If you look at the evolution of The Rock, peaking at his most recent movie, or the movie about two years ago, that uh, was a Black Adam. And then you had you know a plethora all those movie stars like Jake Gyllenhaal any number of yeah. roles we had Zac Efron in that Iron Claw movie it all started with Brad Pitt and Fight Club yeah Brad Pitt and Fight Club was kind of the start you're right you're dead right yeah. that was the first one where people were like oh there was one with Ryan Reynolds in a particular movie who was in very good shape as well it wasn't as big but certainly people noticed it was okay. like a, a men's fitness thing men's fitness like was the only culprit showing lads who clearly yeah took, yeah yeah is that okay yeah okay so you're you keep staring I'm at looking us. over at it so there's um men's men's fitness magazine or men's health magazine was like showing people on gear like Jared Butler from 300 people clearly on gear yeah no one really knew but they weren't big enough to infiltrate kind of people's perception and lads are like yeah I'd like to look like that but not really paying much attention mm-hmm. now every day there's like 2 billion users on Instagram and there's a whole host of genetic leak who are natty all the way to fake natties to Mr. Olympias and men are just unbelievably just spit, have, we've all been so misguided what yeah. the average male can look like with or without PDs 100% I know people who've taken PDs never looked like him absolutely and then I also know people who are lifetime naturally don't train a hell of a lot who also look kind of like him I can think of two people that we know who would look certainly as good as him or not better who are most likely natural one of them's definitely natural yeah. if they went hard at physique for a couple of years yeah. would look like that or better but don't look that quite as good right now absolutely yeah and we've seen how many athletes how many elite athletes we've known seen gone yeah, visit. like yeah, yeah. you know when you think about it it's like we men make no mistake you have been completely allied to with physique wise what is possible yeah that i'm not saying the purpose of that video is so you can actually look very good natural yeah 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 I was, that was the whole point was that there was no drugs for him to be taking but it's very rare that you look like that. So that's why it was so impressive, you know? Yeah. I think as well, a lot of men or like lads who are training now are really falling victim to this thing of like, look, I go to the gym four or five times a week. Hmm. I don't look anything like this. I need to take time off or time away from my weightlifting or powerlifting or whatever it is because I'm going to do a cut and I'm going to look like that. Well, that's true. Yeah. And they won't, you won't get 10% of the way to looking like that. 
and then you end up wasting a load of time trying to chase something that probably isn't that achievable for you. Definitely probably isn't that achievable for you without pharmaceutical help. Mm -hmm. Just because you see all the other guys who are Chinese national team weightlifters or powerlifters who are on a heap of gear or crossfitters who are doing a lot more training than you're ever going to be able to fit into your week. And you think that's what a good level athlete looks like? Good level athletes mostly don't look like that. I have never been that lean and jacked. And look, I think that's fair to say, as humbly as possible, that I have obviously very good genetics for strength and power, yeah. gaining mass. Yeah, yeah. You know, getting a, like 100 kilos, relatively lean, heavier, pretty lean. Like I'm working to get leaner now, probably leaner than I've ever been with as much muscle as possible. And it's still, I'm still training seven times a week, not including separate cardio sessions. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's really fucking difficult to look like that. And then it's just, it's crazy how people's stuff has shifted. And, I, and I'm not mad at anyone who made those comments on TikTok. Like, I was talking to Dara about antagonizing those people to get more views, <laughs> like commenting at them, being like, respond with your physique. So, like, just yeah, random yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. TikTok in my brain is not a, a actual social media thing. It's just a, it's worth a lot of views sometimes, you know, but it's yeah. not. Like, we put a lot of work on the YouTube and Instagram. And, but I'm not mad at any of those people. It's not their fault. That they don't it's know not their that. fault at all. It's just misguided. Yeah, just a kind of lack of understanding as well. You see it. It's way more with the short form content that it's probably because you get more eyes in it. But you get comments from people who are also just like the comment about volume and hypertrophy on the Liu Hao, Liu Li Huang Hua video, um, being like, "Yeah, you lost me when you said volume is important for hypertrophy," hmm. and it's like, "Why don't I just train twenty four seven then?" Like. The misguided statement that's come from some other Instagrammer or something being like, yeah, volume's not the most important thing. And then you say, the first thing you learn, hypertrophy lecture number one is that training volume is important for hypertrophy. Yeah. That's it. Like day one, that's not even something you'd contest. And even for people who go through those debates, like Mike Isertel and stuff, who are debating about volume or debating with, like volume and its importance is non debatable for training for hypertrophy. It's like saying having protein in your diet is non-debatable for training for hypertrophy. But that person's just picked up that sound bite, now holds that in their head as like, this is 100% true. In the same way, like the natty thing or the you can achieve that natty, whatever it is. And then they just never question it. They hold it in their head and then they just bang it out into a comment. Um, just one nuance about that before any comments. So obviously Dara doesn't mean just million loads of volume infinite volume is no. how you get more muscle there's obviously some nuance there yeah but by and large it is volume like it's not one single you know what no. i mean it's it's far more volume than you do for strength training to gain muscle mass if you looked at rep for rep like absolutely people as well commenting like no intensity is the most important thing for for bodybuilding right so intensity is a very easily manipulated variable intensity is basically how difficult something is so if you're lifting weights that might be how fast you lift the weight that might be the total load you have on the bar mm -hmm. that might be the total load you have in the bar versus the rest time you take in between each set how deep into reps you are how deep into reps you are but most of them mean intensity in terms of weight so does one rep at 300 build more muscle in my shoulders than six sets of 10 on shoulder yeah. raises no it doesn't like yeah and then it's also like oh have you read 50 meta-analyses on the use of volume load versus the use of volume as a tracker for hypertrophy training? No, you just listened to the latest soundbite you heard. Like. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, like, we're big proponents of, obviously, training very hard and that you can do way more progress with smart training. Mm. Like, the Seeker Strength app, there's no magic to it. It's just meticulous thought, loads of experience. Like, mm -hmm. people can make progress far beyond their wildest dreams. It happens every week with the Rotating Your Squad program. People are like, Mao, I don't think I can make this. And then it's great in the Facebook group now because people are like, you can definitely do it. Loads of us have done it. And they make way more progress than they can ever imagine. They'll add 20 to 45 kilos onto their squad yeah. in eight weeks. But they're going from 120 to 180. Uh, a lot of people have gotten to 220s and 230s. But then you have to temper that with the fact that, you know, you're not going he, you're not going to look like him with eight weeks of bodybuilding. And neither are you going to squat 200 kilos with an eight-week squat program. Yeah. Like, you people make incredible progress. You can be so much better... And I, the whole goal of Seeker Strength is you don't waste your time. That's what I think of yeah. in Seeker Strength is that I wasted so much time training the wrong way and doing so many wrong things and there's the wrong technique. And I wasted, I like, now I look at my old videos and some of the technique, I'm like, my God, no wonder 
you miss some of those lifts and stuff like that, you know, yeah. and the way you trained. But what I want is that that's why I make all these videos and that's why we're just so to the point itself is because I don't want people to waste their time because you can get so much farther, so much better. Yeah. So much smoother if you know the right things to do, you know. That's why you feel as well as like responding to those questions or responding to those comments that are very rudimentary and it might sound sometimes like we're being short mm -hmm. or like that I'm being short about the volume thing or like any of those things. But understanding now how much is lost mm. through this, like there comes a point where the last thing you need now is another good idea. Like the last <laughs> thing you need <laughs> yes, is to go and question something else. Yeah. Like if you had spent the last six months rather than jumping from program to program mm -hmm. or changing this goal and changing that goal, if you had just for six months gone to the gym twice a week yeah. and done two very simple sessions, gradually build them up, you would be so much further down the line. And like, we know a lot about different styles of programming because we've done every style of programming. Like, all the way through from every single day going as hard as you possibly can and breaking yourself through to virtually no training and just barely holding on to what you have. Um, but you you waste a hell of a lot of time doing that. I did the CAS paper program. I did that. Yeah. I went to the gym for 20 minutes. I went home for 20 minutes. I came back, clean jerks, three different sessions after work and stuff. I did... Tashiki Scott program. Yeah. I said it was stupid, but I did it anyway <laughs> because we want to walk the walk and try things out, even though I know it's wrong. Yeah. It played out exactly as we thought we were going to play. We're going to do a full video on that later in the week, but oh, you've probably seen it by now, actually. But it's like you can get so much further. Like it's not that you couldn't get to 300 with the RCA, but you'd have to start at a reasonable place, you know? Yeah. And when it comes to physique, it's, it's hard to appreciate. Genetics play such a big role with physique in such a different way to other sports because the objective measurements of progress are so different, you know. It's like, it, it's... You don't get people who come into the gym and can only squat 60 kilos the first time and then they just blow up on their 250 squatter in a few years. That just doesn't happen. Like, no. my, just give my specific example. I could squat 120 for reps the first time I squatted with a barbell. So probably close to double body weight. I was like 75 kilos. That's probably 140. Probably a double body weight squat the first time I squatted a barbell, you know? Yeah. Doesn't happen a lot. Like, I can't bench 140. I'm sure I could if I wanted to, yeah, but I was never yeah, yeah. very gifted. I can remember failing 60, 70 kilo benches, yeah. you know? But when you've stuff like, you've people with physique who start off amazing like that, or you get people who start off with, like, you should see the pictures of Chris Bumpson as a teenager. You're like, that's your, you don't look anything. Like, you look, you're just, an, it's moderately toned teenager. No way. Yeah, you should see it. I'll put some up here, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, now he looks amazing. Yeah. Do you know, like it's, yeah. it's physique can fuck people up and it's so, the the mating thing and the human brain. The human brain gets to a lot of people, doesn't it? That's, I never thought about that there. There's so many people ask us about bodybuilding and weightlifting and I never really thought about it and then I kind of thought, oh, I've always assumed it's to do with you just want to get better at weightlifting. No. Me, of course, just being focused on getting better at weightlifting but I never thought that you just want to look better. I'd never thought yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of fucked. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, I never thought about that. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look better. No. I, I think for a lot of athletes as well, if you're not in great shape and you're into power sports, whatever it is, and you get in better shape and you look better, you'll definitely have some better outcomes because of it. But what we're mainly talking about is like not understanding where that, not end goal, but where the current goal should be. Mm. Like that's the thing I find all the time. Someone will drop like maybe seven, eight, ten kilos they look way better. Like, going from very much out of shape to being like, oh, yeah, you definitely train a bit, you know? Yes. Like, going from a sloppy 92 to a fairly toned 85, that's a big difference. The problem is, is that specifically with, for powerlifters and weightlifters, they'll cut like 10 kilos and then they won't temper their expectations <laughs> Because then they'll, they'll cut the 10 kilos, right? And they'll be much lighter and they'll be much happier and they'll look better and everything's great and they're healthier or whatever. But then their lifting is going worse. Yeah. But they're just as mad that their lifting is going worse. They're just as annoyed that their lifting is going worse. They're just upset that their lifting is going worse than if they hadn't cut that 10 kilos. So if they'd stayed heavier and the lifting was going that bad, they are just upset. But you have to be like, oh, I'm after losing a significant amount of fat, but I'm also reducing calories. I've definitely lost the muscle. No yeah. one most natural athletes can't cut weight 
yeah, and I'd yeah, lose yeah. some muscle, you know. Yeah. And so when you cut 10 kilos or 5 kilos or whatever it is, whatever percentage of your body weight it ends up being, and then your training is just not going as well, a lot of athletes have a hard time just going, you know what, that's, fuck it, I made the decision to go yeah. away because I wanted to lose weight. They're just as upset that their training is not going as well, you know. Yeah, and then there's a whole host of issues that come along with that then. Because then they're like, oh, I need to program weightlifting differently. Mm-hmm. I need to get to the gym more. I need to do more in the gym. I need to change this. Maybe my technique is off. The other thing, like when you have those big body size changes is things feel different. Mm-hmm. Like your squat feels so different. Your overhead position feels so different. Like you've lost 15 or 18 kilos in the lat. Like you're 120 now, aren't you? Yeah, uh, well, nearly. Like if you run down, I'm 120. Yeah. So you were like 138 kilos four weeks ago. Like, your overhead has to feel different now. My, it feels worse. Does it feel worse? My back go feels so much better. Does so it? Like in the rack position, yeah. You should try doing 300 again. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll probably... I, I guess I'd stay around 270, and I'm, I reckon I'm pretty close to that. So Body weight. E pounds. <laughs> so what I do twice a week now is, like, four to six triples at 220 every time okay. I squat. And that's, like, I know that'll keep me there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, it is... It's... Like, women have a terrible time. Yeah. No doubt about that. Yeah. But men's time has gotten progressively worse. And people don't understand. Because y- you've missed a time where... Yeah, like, a lot of people are newer. It's the newer generation. And then there's so many teenagers taking sarms, it blows my mind. Every time... It's absolutely mental. Every time I talk to a teenager involved in sports, it's in jiu-jitsu or way. My friend has started taking this thing. Or part, it's always my friend. Yeah. And then you see the friend and you're like, oh, of course, oh, holy shit, of, of course. course you are, yeah. And I'm like, like that drives me mental. Yeah, It's people snatching, clean and jerking and doing muscle-ups when they're pregnant and teenagers taking SARMs. I just, I can't. And it, it like, oh my God, the teenagers taking SARMs thing just... Oh, stop. Like the pregnancy thing is fine. Like you should obviously exercise just as a caveat. And we actually get a lot of emails about that. Yeah. Uh, and we're always like, look, we don't recommend weightlifting after a certain period of time. Yeah. Accidents always happen and they can be very consequential accidents. Your lifting is only going to get yeah. worse. Your technique is going to get worse. You're not going to get better at lifting yeah. after a certain period of time. If you do that, that's your own choice. I'm not going to go look at your stuff and be like, I'm mad at you. But we always recommend keep exercising, keep training. My yeah. wife kept training up until I'm actually pretty sure she was in CrossFit class the day her water broke. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she was training that day. So that exercise, we're all for it. Yeah. But the weightlifting thing, I really think it's a bad idea because the risks are just not worth it. hundred percent. Like if you fall up a, a pull-up bar doing muscle-ups or something or whatever, you know, or mm. a bar, you fall backwards. So plates are meant for the distance between you and the ground. You lie flat back. The reason they're that height is they'll roll over you. Yeah. Your bump is much higher than that. Yeah, you know? Like yeah, there's yeah. just so many things. That's by and by. But the teenagers taking SARMs. It's absolutely mental how prevalent they're. Yeah. They're buying them on like TikTok stores and stuff as well. But the thing is, they've done studies and loads of them are real SARMs. Yeah. A really high percentage are real SARMs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be but better if they were faked. The big problem is, or what I foresee being a big problem in like eight years, is when those lads, and probably girls as well, are 25. There was a lot of that I've seen, yeah, not as much. but as yeah. yeah, but when they're 25 and you start getting that bit of a slump, Things might be going quite so well. Mm. Like, there's a massive issue with mental health now. Yes. When most people aren't suffering with hypogonadism. Mm. What's it going to be like then? Because, like, a massive portion of the population now, from the age of 17 to 30, are really struggling with that. Like, mental health is a massive issue. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. What's it going to be like then? When you could have up to 5% of the population who've been railing SARMs on and off every second day for three weeks for f- four years. The problem, so obviously the health consequences are really bad for them, or are potentially very bad mm. for them. You can get lucky and be fine. But what they don't think about, of course they don't think about because they're 16-year-olds, <laughs> is that they can't maintain that physique because they mm. don't know how to train, but it's unsubstantiated because they don't have the particular hormonal environment to maintain that physique when they get older. Because if they stop taking SARMs, you have to keep taking SARMs. But like they, they don't appreciate that. What's going to happen eventually when you stop taking SARMs? Mm-hmm. Like you can't maintain it. And I don't know where... Where are they learning to take SARMs? TikTok. Do you think that's it? And the internet. 
But who's telling them? Nobody's you just go and Google it. No one's telling them to take sound. But if you like, Google how much Ostrine do I take and yeah. you just go onto any bodybuilding forum, it's just there. Yeah. That think, information did not exist. Well, it was all Because like, I looked for it everywhere and I couldn't find it. With your teenager. I know for a fact it didn't exist. Do you, you would have taken Sam's when you were playing rugby? I, Garf, I would have taken rat poison if I could have gotten it. It's huge in teenage rugby in Ireland yeah. in particular I know that I'm, I don't know what it's like in other countries but I know in teenage rugby in Ireland it's massive. gear didn't exist in underage rugby when I played rugby not for your place not for even schools players maybe a bit of clan that was it no it did exist for the certain right people like 100% it did have to 100% very very rare well they made some international if you look teams. at like the Irish 20s teams back then they definitely did 100% there's no doubt about it if you look at the size and the it numbers is. those lads put up, no, I would say... It, of course it did. It had to have. Uh, There's uh, no way it didn't. It existed, but I don't think... In Ireland back then, I don't think prevalence was that high. You're roast into the glasses. No, I remember... I watched those 20s games. I watched the multiple under-20s World Cups. Mm. You you could see when it started happening. No, but it was still there for some individuals. Like It was, but now it's like if you're playing oh, schools crazy. rugby... It's there. No, like it's crazy. You go to the gym in town. Yeah. But you, they talk about it fairly openly. Any of them you've talked to are like the some teenagers in jiu-jitsu. They're mm-hmm. like, oh, my buddy's taking SARMs. What do you think? And I'm like, no. No. No, please don't take SARMs. Yeah, it's... um. Don't take anything. It used to be a big... Like, even when we were underage, English rugby players and English schools players. Boo. By God, you could see it. Really? Yeah. When you, at your, when you were playing rugby? Yeah. Yeah, you could definitely see it. And it was a big thing and it was talked about... And like they were trying to curtail it or whatever. The one of the only people to test positive for GH was actually an English rugby player, and he is someone ratted him out. Actually, it was interesting enough they ratted on him, so they went and tested him. Yeah, but a uh, Welsh player tested or got popped for GH just for the World Cup. Yeah, very big or formerly big rugby mm. player. We did a video on that as well, didn't we? We did. But the the same thing. Yeah, it's just it's <laughs> it's worrying. Uh, I don't know if it's going to go anywhere either. The Sarms? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think what you're going to see is maybe better quality information becoming more prevalent. Hmm. So you'll probably have one or two big incidents, maybe multiple people dying in the same time, uh, maybe kind of big names, a few die-offs, and that will probably bring some more publicity to it, and then see, maybe th- a bit more being done over it. The thing is, I don't think you're going to see people die from it. You're just going to see like chronic long-term issues. Yeah, we know a few individuals who have taken PDs as teenagers, mm-hmm. uh, mid to late stage teenagers, you know, and, and they're our age now. And it's so funny, like the pharmacokinetics, your individual. How fast or how slow you break down drugs and all the related uh, metabolic pathways and outcomes. It's so funny how it affects individuals because yeah. some of them are really, really fine now. Some of them have varying degrees of issues. Some of them have no issues. Some of them have lots of issues. It's really, it's... Um, some of them are revol- getting worse and worse issues as time goes on. That is, the, yeah, that is one of the things. Some of them uh, issues are getting worse. We have like mental health issues and then you've got like hormonal issues still mm. prevalent. Now... I will say not, and I've just been given out about not encouraging people to take SARMs, but there really is a correct way to do things, and then there's a dumb way to do things. Yes. Like, we don't we don't go to many athletes on gear, but there is a certain cohort to them. Mm-hmm. It's usually the some of the better athletes are the higher performing ones, and it's, um, you, you just get two camps. Like, you get some people who are... They listen to the people we tell them to go listen to, <clears throat> and everything just goes so well for them, so smoothly. Bloods, everything's so healthy. And then I feel like, I feel like when people are that way with their drugs, mm-hmm. they're that way with everything. Yes, yes. You can true. tell from ten thousand feet if someone is going to be mm-hmm. good when it comes to it. And then sometimes I've had athletes approach me saying, "Oh, look, this is what I'm planning in the next year." And having maybe I've coached him for a while, or maybe I've had kind of brief interactions with him previously. Yes, and I'll just be like, "You are, you are not that guy." Yeah, yeah. Because I know for a fact that you're going to forget to do this, or mm-hmm. not continue to do this, or you know, your lifestyle really doesn't suit it. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's aside from like the genetic things. Some people are just better at taking drugs than other people. 
Yeah, some people are just more organized with it. Mm. Like our bread and butter is natural athletes. Yeah. Of varying levels of performance. You know, natural athletes who are at world level and you then you've unnatural athletes who are very high up in world level and winning medals. Uh we've thought quite a few people out of it over the years. Quite a number of people who've who even if they had the potential you could just tell they don't have the personality or like this yeah. is really and I'm glad a lot of them listened. You're like this isn't for you. Like this is such a this is a bad route to go down. You know, Mike gets to tell as kind of one of the bigger people who's talked about this, who talks about drugs sometimes. He's like, you just you have to be ready for this kind of decision, you know. And and some people take them, and you just know it's going to go fine for them because mm-hmm. they've like within reason, of course. Like they've they're really diligent with their training. They're well organized. They're a teacher. They're a doctor. They're an engineer, yeah. or a professional at least, and they've done everything up to that point. And you know, if they take the next step, things just keep going for them. And it does usually like yeah. if touching wood haven't been wrong yet, you know. But yeah, like the most of our, I'd say ninety nine percent, ninety nine point five percent of our athletes are natural. Yeah, definitely over ninety nine percent. Yet, uh, will I? So, this is one thing you'll never hear from other coaches or other athletes is that most people who take gear, even when they tell you they take gear, lie about the amount of gear they're taking, how long they took gear, when they started taking what gear, they took. what they took, when right now. Like, you'll have an athlete PB, and they will look amazing. Mm. They'll PB, and you'll be like, oh, what's happening with that? Can you just keep me updated? And they'll just blatantly lie to you, or you'll know that this doesn't correlate, or they'll say nothing, and you're like... Oh, why are you lying? Like, I know, we know that. Everybody knows, like, everybody, I know who's telling you. I can go ask them, like, yeah, and they'll yeah, tell yeah. me exactly what you're doing. Yeah, like. I know who's prescribing that. Yeah, I know what's going on, like. It's, uh, and it's so prevalent. Like, most people who take PDs lie about it. One thing is, obviously, we never, ever get involved in that. We're never, like, no, switch no, 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 We're no. always just, like, most time it's telling people I don't think you should do it when it comes up, you know, um, but... It's just... The line thing is so interesting and you'd never know until you're really involved. It's bizarre. Every single... I remember dealing with somebody once who had explained in depth what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Then goes, hits numbers far beyond what they had done previously. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, obviously you probably did the same thing this time around or whatever. Like, no, no, use nothing this time. Yeah. And you're like... What are you talking about? Like, you don't put 15 kilos on your total in eight months, mm-hmm. gain a nice bit of muscle, still shredded to death. Yeah. And you're going to sit there across from a Zoom call for me. Yeah, yeah. And just like, no, 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 none of that. And like, sometimes it doesn't matter that you know they're lying. It makes a difference, you know. But like, uh, there's a time when, it, uh, I won't say, they were snatching a weight for like f- sets of five, basically, right? And it was massive. Yes. Very big weights for sets of five. And they were like, I was like, oh, what the fuck are you doing at the moment? You know, basically. Yeah. And they were like, oh, there's nothing right now. And we're like, why? why? This is more. Than it's a really th- weird cognitive block for people. The thing now is a lot of times online is if you admit it, it's like, oh, I'm just on TRT. That's like the new natty. That's the new thing. thing yeah. On TRT for my health. Or you downplay how much you're taking. Yeah. Based on your genetics. Zach talks about that a lot as well is that it's a real catch 22. So like you can. Te- if everyone's really honest everyone's more realistic what's going on but then are you encouraging more people to say yeah it? yeah yeah so then like if you say how much you're really on are yeah. you encouraging I think you are I think you're you are encouraging people to I think you definitely are do you, did I tell you about the fella Chase Irons and Vicar Steve no so he was he was the most honest I've ever seen anyone online okay about how much people actually take so obviously we know a few of the consultants who do that stuff and they'll tell you what Big people. They won't tell you yeah, who. Yeah, they'll never. Yeah. Obviously, they just yeah. kind of keep it secret. But they'll tell you who. They'll give you a demographic and how much they're taking. You know, so ballpark. Just ask them, like you know, and, and you guys know who we're talking about. And most like you'll have people like to come out and be like, "Yeah, I was just doing in the off season 125 milligrams of testosterone," and then, <laughs> and then your man Chase Irons came out and said, and it was grams of gear. Yeah, a lot of um, growth hormone and stuff. And yeah, like, yeah. And he was just, yeah, that's what they take. That's what most of us, are, our size, take. You know, and that's... Yeah. Like... Also, like, there is there is genetic variance in terms... Somebody might take 
500 milligrams, another person might take a gram, another person take, might take two grams. And they might all have the same effect. Mm. But when you get to a certain size or yeah. a certain level of performance, mm -hmm. nobody's doing that with small amounts. Yeah. Nobody's doing that with TRT and some peptides. Yeah. Like, full stop. Doesn't matter if you are the goat of goat genetics with your pharmacology. Yeah. You just need a lot of it. Like, nobody's at the 100 meter final on a little bit of growth and a small bit of peptides. Well, the, the funny thing is, is like, it'll be for like six weeks. So like, yeah, my off season was just TRT and I look like this. And you're like, yeah, because there's still six grams of a half life still in your system. Like, that's <laughs> yeah, why yeah. you're massive. And so, you've been taking DECA for two years. Yeah, there's still a lot of DECA in your system. They could harvest you for that. <laughs> yeah, that's like, you can milk you for DECA. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. You, your blood's like, if you give blood, someone's going to gain some uh, soft tissue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is, um, like, it's funny because. I agree, like, you shouldn't, they, they, to be honest, I, I think it's it's more harm that if everyone was honest with their dosages in that regard. I, I think it would just encourage more people, because what we see with SARMs and stuff like that, you know, with teenagers taking them, like, if everyone knew the real honest truth, I think, of a lot of that stuff, I think it would be, uh, I think, possibly for a while at least. The other really weird thing with SARMs is, like, Google ads pop up for SARMs. I'm pretty sure you had Instagram ads for SARMs. I'm pretty sure in the UK they're not legal. They're not. No, it, it's all decriminalized in the UK. But I think SARMs in particular don't even fall under that class. So someone in the UK who knows this in particular wants to clarify, but I'm pretty sure they're not even like decriminalized because they're not illegal to sell. No way. I'm pretty sure that's why a lot of them are real when people order them. Yes. Because the people, like some of those teenagers we know have yeah, been yeah, getting yeah. real SARMs. Yeah. Like, but that's what the research shows. There's been mm. at least two papers I can think of. It was like the high 80% of stuff actually contained performance enhancing drugs, you know? Yeah. Yeah, SARMs are a whole level of squeaky bum time when it comes to downstream effects. Yeah, who knows? And that's like the big lies that are being told, of like, oh no, you won't lose your hair. It's like, buddy, to be honest, don't be worried about losing your hair mm. if you're going to have fucking ass cancer next year. Yeah. Like, SARMs are a whole other arena of consequence. Yeah. In in terms of like scary consequences, whatever about acne, losing your hair, bad skin, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's like cosmetic stuff, you know. Pe yeah. It matters a lot to people. People care about, a lot about it. But in terms of like life-changing effects, that's not important. The stuff that's really important is like cancerous growths in your intestinal tract. What I do think though is that you should be able to allow, you should be able to buy everything yes. legally. I agree. I think it should be taxed or whatever. Not too much because it's taxed <laughs> up enough here. But that's kind of where I'd fall on that stuff. Like you yeah. should be allowed to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't encourage you to murder someone. Like Ever Titan sponsored Craig Jones' podcast, right? El Segundo. And he's like, yeah, I get my Anavar and my test from from Titan or Ever Titan. And that's like a, a hormonal replacement thing. Is That's it? a health care provider in Texas. It'd be nice to find a healthcare provider who does Anavar for... Imagine that. HRT. Yeah. I, My Anavar levels are low. <laughs> I really think there's nothing wrong with that, though. They, yeah. um, they are grown men and women... Absolutely. ...who know what they're doing. Yeah. Everyone knows what's going on. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's your life. What does it matter to people in 40 years' time? Yeah. It makes no... But people get so mad. And this is one of the things we talked about. It was like Sam Sulek's thing, where everyone was like, buddy's going to die in a few years. Why the fuck do you care? But or like the guy jumping off a roof and doing a flip on the new show. Same thing. Where are you going to be in 15 years? Like Owen squatted, th you squatted 300 kilos last month, right? Two months ago, yeah. Two months ago. No, last month, yeah. Fucking hell. Nobody should look at that video and be like, yeah, I wonder what you're going to squat in 15 years time. Yeah, what? That does not matter. Like you're talking about sports performance. It doesn't last forever. No. You're not here. I get it if you were some sort of craftsman carpenter mm -hmm. and they're looking at like this timber archway you're building in some Japanese garden yeah. they're like that glue joint isn't gonna last three winters yeah I get that's that that's kind of fair yeah but in this case it's like sports performance is fleeting mm. like think about it like taking a breath of air in you're gonna leave it go at some point yeah that's it's just it's so weird but it's just losers who make those comments it is it 100%. is just losers do you know if it was like he went to his doctor Sam Sulek went to his doctor and were like Sam you're asking me how your health is and I think you're not in a good place whatever yeah. but that's a totally different scenario it's some random one on Instagram Yeah, it's a loser mentality 100% you've, you've initiated this f false sense of superiority over mm. someone doesn't matter what they do it, yeah. it makes no difference to you why do you care yeah 
What? It's just virtue signaling. I lose your shit. This, That's what it is. Yeah, something's just popped into my head there, but it's from another YouTuber, and I don't want to talk smack on them. But they were kind of talking smack about Sam Sulek and what people say about him. We just won't bring it up. It's not worth it. A lot of it's a lot of people have said Sam's theme, and I agree with them, is that it's because he's so jacked. But he's like a normal person who's so jacked. But these people aren't saying that in a derogatory term, you know. But then there's other people who say it in a way that it's like, oh, if he wasn't so jacked. But if my squat wasn't so big, no one would care. What? <laughs> but if you're saying Bolt wasn't the fastest man in the world for a long time... Nobody would know his name. No. Why would you know him? If Chris Bumstead didn't look like a Greek statue, yeah. he wouldn't be Chris Bumstead. I think as well with in, in Sam Sulek's case is like his age, mm-hmm. how jacked he is, yeah, his consistency of uploading, yeah, and the consistency of the videos in general, and then all that combined with as he's talking, he just speaks normally, like a normal human being. But like a lot of that generation are listening to Andrew Tate for a very long time. <laughs> I would much prefer you listen to Sam Sulek. Absolutely, yeah. Go shopping with Sam Sulek. Let them have let them have their person. Like, yeah. Who do we have? No one. Clock off? No, not really. Yeah, there it is. It slipped out of you. Who else? That was you? a little Freudian slip. There you is, hate Dimitri Clockoff. I don't. I only intend to annoy you. Yeah. There's a Dimitri Clockoff picture staring at me from behind your shoulder. I don't know where my opinions end and where I want to annoy you start sometimes. I have no idea. And it goes on for years. Like I could carry this on for five years. Yeah, and I'm, you've no idea. You don't even know what side of the argument you're on. You wait to see what side I fall on and yeah. then you pick it. Yeah. Like, I, I'd i let them have Sam Sulek. Like. I really like Sam Sulek. Like, realistically, and I'm asking you now, do you think, and anyone listening, do you think someone watching Sam Sulek is going to change their mind about gear? That one... Watching that one person. Do you think that would change someone's mind? Yes. Okay. I do. Do you think that would put someone over the edge, though? Or, or Sorry, do you think that would take someone who was never going to take gear to taking gear? Or no. do you think it would push someone over the edge? No. Because I don't think it would take someone who no. wasn't going to do it. And as well, it's not like he's the only person in the world taking gear. Mm-hmm. And it's not like he's your first introduction to it and your last introduction to it. Like He's he's one data point in terms of the entire span of it. I. To be honest, I would see people like Mike Isretel, Vigorous Steve, to a lesser extent, someone like uh, More Plates, More Dates, Derek. Mm. I think those people will lead to more people taking gear eventually than just passively watching someone. So when you're passively watching someone, Mm -hmm. you're obviously observing how jacked their technique is. You're observing how successful they're becoming and how much traction they're gaining. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like the guys putting out a lot of information, which is hugely valuable, mm. like should be done, I think that kind of information and the ready the readily available information they produce leads to more people then deciding to take gear because of that. Like I like Mike Mike Easterton's way because like he's never denied it, you know. But yeah, he's always been very coy about what he does or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and he never really gives any information on it. I suppose in Vigor C's case, like that's his thing, you know. And I suppose absolutely, yeah, you have to put your information out there. You can't be responsible. I also don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying that in a bad way where it's like, oh, it's oh, their okay, fault. I you were, okay. No, no, I'm just saying when someone goes to make a decision like that, I'd foresee procurement of information being a far more important aspect of that rather than passively admiring someone and their success. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah. I definitely don't think it's a bad thing. I think those lads, like in particular, those three guys are doing a great job of getting better quality information out there. Mm. Um, and like some real world information out there in terms of vigorous these case very very valuable information mm-hmm. um, you could make an argument for people like vigorous Steve and Alex Geekel and Broderick yeah is that them putting their information out there is maybe in some part contributing to some more people potentially taking gear but ultimately they're moving the needle in terms of what is more sa- what's safer more feasible what's realistic ways to correct issues you know yeah as opposed to what people are doing 10 years ago yeah as which was completely ridiculous you know like that i there's an argument i suppose this with like drug education and stuff is that you have the correct information is better in yeah the long rather run. than just going and taking a second edible because the first one didn't hit you yet because no individual is influencing the cultural of like the cultural activities of Gen Z, like no one no. individual has encouraged them to take SARMs. They've just rolled on into the internet, 
realise people are taking SARMs. No one knows who first talked about SARMs in their friend group. It was just SARMs as a thing. Someone yeah. started taking it. You saw your friend get really jacked. You saw him shifting a load of girls. And you're like, fuck. And you saw him smashing people in rugby. Yeah. And you saw him going to the gym. And he's been deadlifting 220 sumo now. And you're like, I want to fucking deadlift 220 yeah, sumo. Because yeah, you're yeah, a yeah. stupid teenager. Yeah. Not a lot of stupid teenagers listen to this. Some of them on Instagram. The younger demographic on Instagram. But, like... You're very stupid when you're a teenage boy. Yeah. Very stupid. <laughs> you're telling me. Like, I was really stupid when you're a teenage boy. It used to annoy me when I was a teenager when I heard other people say this. But now that I'm older, I'm like, oh. Yeah, I was, I was stupid. stupid. I was stupid. Jeez, oh. I was fully dumb. Yeah. Like, did a lot of stupid things. But I'm not saying that in a bad way either. No. Like, you have to go through that process. Imagine how boring life would have been if you just did everything right the first time. Holy shit, that would have been terrible. Yeah. I also think as well, like, that information being available makes it a lot safer in terms of, like, people take certain things to get performance outcomes or to get aesthetics outcomes. Mm-hmm. And when things aren't going well, the easy button is you just ramp it up. You know, if you were taking some ash on, you go from 200 to 400, go from 400 to 800, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you have more, more legible information out there, more kind of, intelligently structured information out there yeah. like that, that information has existed for a long time mm-hmm. um but it's in a physiology book somewhere in a university library and it's very very difficult for you to pick through that and figure out what applies to you i think the availability of that information leads to far safer interactions with peds than anything else like so the the realistic scenario was that if you want to be a world champion in most sports specifically for male athletes but certainly teenage or female athletes as well but to a slightly a ever so slightly mm-hmm. lesser extent and i'm talking about a two-year difference lesser extent male athletes have to start taking in pretty much all sports that are in the olympics pretty much all most real sports power sports endurance sports speed sports strength sports you have to probably start taking peds when you're 17 or 18 combat sports judo all of that stuff jiu-jitsu and We've encountered some athletes like that. And even though I know that's the way to top class, I still don't want them doing that. No. I still don't want them engaging with anything for years. Because the problem ever. is, even if you are world champ, yeah, you win seven world champs, whatever it is, you make a career off it. Mm-hmm. You have an endocrine system that forever is very likely to be compromised. Yeah, You've a level of neural degradation or lack there of neural uh growth that would probably stay with you forever mm. a whole host of well maybe not regression alteration say alteration you don't know what would have been you don't yeah sorry it's impossible to know what would have been but you get there are definite neuro neural outcomes from taking androgens younger in life when yeah. your brain isn't fully developed definite um and they don't go away. Yeah, so the problem with male brains is you're developing later. And it's it's mm. well documented, you know. And you were that kind of twenty three, twenty five thing I know see so the problem is when Joe Rogan says things so much it sounds like a cliche, but he seems to be on the ball in regards to that development. Uh there's a, a very interesting book I was reading last year. It was it's like Boys and Men or something. So he was making an argument that you should actually probably send boys to school about a year later because mm-hmm. the reason females are academically outperforming men at the same ages across different time points in the education systems across a couple of countries is that females are just a bit more developed. And you know that when we were in the final year of school, females were just girls and whatever were studying more consistently, yeah. more diligently, had a very more definitive outcome in regards to that on average, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was talking about men, but male athletes, you know, it's too late at 25 is the crazy problem, is the crux of the issue, you know. Yeah, it's too late if well, you want that level. And if you want it for long enough. Yes. So you could still get to that level. You could <clears> still be a very talented weight if they're trained super diligently till you're 24 or something. To, yeah. Let's say 23. Yeah, yeah. Last day tested positive at the European Juniors I was at. I was 17. I think he was like, I think, was he like 18 or something? He, yeah. That's his far, that was his only time testing positive. You know, he's been on how many World Championships, how many Olympics? How many doses was he missed out if he waited, you know? If he mm-hmm. waited till he was 23 or 24 or 25 yeah. to take PD. I think especially now with, 
with how well older athletes are doing, mm. that might start to change. I don't think it will. I don't think it will because they won't stop doping teenagers. No, they won't. They're like that's the unfortunate truth of it is is like oh, it might they might get to that level, but why risk it? I think to be honest with you, it's not going to be a problem in, in ten to fifteen years. Yeah, I think AI is going <clears> to <throat> change stuff so widely that we can't fathom what is going to happen. I don't think it's going to matter. I'm just going to be in the woods. They'll find you in the woods. That's the thing. They like, won't. It'll be able to predict what They'll you're doing. Find me. This uh, this went way this off. This is topic. weird. How far? How long have we been we're recording? We're in ten minutes in. That's twenty five years of thoughts about <coughs> gear, there, lads. And yeah. And what else I had on the thing was not that. I want to talk about Fairbairn Sykes. You know, the World War Two commandos being trained in knife fighting from the yes. Chinese police, the English fellas, yeah. uh, mostly Sykes and the knife he developed. And the takeovers they do in donuts, you know, in the intersections, the crossroads in America. But the what? You know, they go doing donuts and the people get hit by the cars and stuff. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not what we talked about. So the, we'll take, um, take that for next week. That knife fighting thing. I have some thoughts on that. Keep that in for next week. Yeah, I'll keep that in. That was Thanks a heavy very much for listening. Fuck. That yeah. was heavy. That started heavy and ended heavy. I want to do a shit talk because I didn't want to talk about serious training stuff, but now we've ended up. And you pumped out an hour and 11 minutes of serious thought. <sighs> That's Alpha GPC for you. <laughs> so there it is, guys. That's <clears> them. <throat> it's a lot of us. We deal with a lot of realities. Most of them are natural athletes. There's a lot of good athletes. If you'd like to have a, a thought come into it, the, if there's something that you think about a lot, do you'd like to hear us think about or our thoughts on it? Keep it to yourself. Do send it into the comments of this because Owen will put it in his little script that doesn't get shared with anyone and uh, might pop up. Have so okay, okay. I feel like there's animosity in the room. There is, yeah. Do you want to see the script before we talk? Yeah, because you did it last week yeah. and I complained about it. Right. And then today, this morning, yeah. I said, Oh, you're gonna have one of them scripts again. Yeah, you yeah. said I'm sarcastic, so I'm not gonna show you if it's gonna be like that. But also, you surely picked up the vibe that like a shit talk podcast doesn't have a script. It's a non-scripted shit talk podcast. No, shit talk is a talk about random stuff that's not training. It doesn't mean it's not scripted. I thought it was just a, like an ebbing and flowing, meandering chat. With specific directions, yeah. Like that one went off topic, but we can't just come in willy-nilly and do an hour and a half. Why? Of... That's what we've always done. No, most of the shit talks, I've thought about stuff before we came in here. I didn't learn about the dark forest theory and, and um, this discovery of aliens by accident. Yeah, but you have it in your head, like. Yeah, but these are just in my head. These are, look at the lines I've written there. There's four <laughs> words. Nah, you're going to simplify the script now. Look, there's three words, Fair yeah. Baron Sykes. And, and that would have been so... One says, one says, w- one says takeovers, and the other said jacked guy. I didn't even know what yeah. jacked guy until you remembered. Yeah, well, that would have been so hard to put into the company email, wouldn't it? Do you know what? That would have been so hard to have a shared memo for. This is your fault for this going so far off track, because if I didn't remember the jacked guy, we could just talk about knife fighting. So it's your fault. You're at that knife fighting is uh forget about it now. This podcast is finished. Are we done now? We're done. Not fair band sykes. Talk about next week. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much for tuning in. We will never learn about you, how many knife fights that guy got in and how we trained the British commandos, <coughs> American commandos. <coughs> it's all over now. He was British. It, forget about it. Turn off the recording. Thanks, lads. <laughs>